Okay, so our next speaker is Melina Freitag, who is now at the University of Potsdam, uh, and um, is going to talk about uh, inexact uh, methods for a low rank solution to um, Lyapunov equations. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fran, and also thank you, Stefan, Stephanie, and also Nick for organizing uh, this, this meeting and also uh, for this kind invitation. I'm very uh, honored to be a part of it. Um, I followed the talk so far and it's been, um, it's been great and I'm really sorry I can't be there. Um, uh, I was very much looking forward to actually coming uh, because uh, the UK has been my, my home for a long time and I considered my second home, but um, unfortunately it didn't work out. Uh, so at the start of my talk, um, I'd like to, um, well, I'd like to start my talk with, with the personal reflection because when you um, do your PhD in the UK, which I did, uh, not at Manchester, but at Bath, uh, in numerical analysis, it's very hard to not come across Nikayam, uh, in fact, both I am. Um, so I came across Nick relatively quickly during the first year of uh, my PhD. And I tried to dig out some photos and the, uh, the photos are not as great because I'm not as uh, the good photographer as, as, as Nick, but uh, these are the ones I, I came up with. So the first row, you can actually see some of the, um, a meeting in Dundee. This was during my first year of a PhD. I remember giving a talk, uh, wasn't even a year into my PhD, and the first row of the talk was Palette in the Ikhayan and Dingolop, and uh, it was very nerve-wracking, but uh, I survived and uh, I, I stayed in the community, so it wasn't, wasn't too bad. Um, I had also many great visits uh, to, to Manchester uh, after this, so um, many seminars, meetings, workshops. I'm very grateful for uh, uh, Nick and, and Fran and the Manchester team for organizing those. Um, and uh, I think a piece of examinations as well. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you both, uh, Fran and Nick, for creating this very nice atmosphere. Um, uh, can you put your microphone closer to your mouth? Yeah, is this better now? It's yeah. better. Yeah. Okay, so I, I try to keep it up to here. Um, on the second row, there's actually a meeting, in, in, uh, and I was at meeting at Penn State, so I, uh, I don't even know if that meeting still exists. That was also fairly um, early in my PhD, so Nick, Nick was there too. Um, and I have a second photo from there, and it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit dark, but what you can see, you, you can see Nick there if you, if you look closely. There's a, there's a proof of uh, that he was playing piano, and uh, there's some young PhD students listening. There's uh, Ivan here, and also Beresford Palette uh, enjoying the performance of of Nick, uh, I think he was playing a ragtime there and I was very fortunate to, uh, to be able to listen to that. Um, I cannot play the piano, but what I learned from, from Nick is, is well, trying to learn from Nick is uh, trying to aspire to uh, communicate well. You'll see uh, during the talk that I'm still a long way from that. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Nick, and uh, happy birthday. Uh, so. What I'll talk about is um, matrix equations, and I apologize to the people who are in the audience have also been to the householder meeting. Uh, so there's a, there's a, this is a sort of uh, um, a, a version of the talk I gave at the householder meeting, but uh, maybe, 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 uh, maybe I can improve on my communication and uh, try to give a, a nice mixed communication talk. So I'm trying to solve uh, Lyapunov uh, equations uh, AX plus XA transpose is minus BB transpose in the right hand side here is usually uh, of low rank. There are many applications uh, for this uh, from model order reduction control theory, um, numerical solutions to PDEs, image processing, and also nowadays uh, uh, uncertainty quantification. So we assume that the, the eigenvalues of, of A are in the right half plane. So then we know there is exist a, a unique solution, uh, which is positive definite and also symmetric, um, uh, semi-definite actually. And um, if the if n is relatively small, we can use uh, Bartle Stewart, and you all know about this. Uh, but Bartle Stewart has complexity n cubed and requires uh, n squared memory, so we, we don't want to use this for large n. Right. Um, Often times when the right hand side is of low rank, which is the case we consider here, um, we, we can um, use iterative algorithms. So we, we know the X is then still dense um, and we don't really want to store the, the, the full X, but uh, we can actually store a low rank version of X knowing that the singular values uh, of X decay rapidly. 
So this has been shown by several people, uh, Tilo Penzel, Lars Pratik, and then the group uh, around Peter Benner. And what we try to do is aim to compute this low rank approximation. So this is nothing new. Um, and there's many algorithms for doing, so, uh, doing this. And what I will concentrate on also the, since Stefan is there uh, is the rational pool of uh, subspace methods or one version of rational, rational pool of subspace methods. So we assume that X can be decomposed into um, Z, Z transpose. So these are two low rank factors. And there's also ADI methods, which I'm not going to talk about here, but uh, a lot of the theory that, I'm, um, that I have in this talk actually carries over to uh, ADI methods. So just as a recall, what do um, rational pool of subspace methods do? They're essentially uh, uh, based on a Galerkin projection. So we, we choose um, a subspace of Rn. Usually the, these are columns uh, of orthogonal uh, matrices. So QJ is a matrix of orthogonal columns. Um, and uh, we, we project onto the subspace. So the, the way to how we choose the QJ basically determines the, the method. So here is just a general uh, matrix QJ, uh, which is uh, orthogonal, whose, whose columns are orthogonal. Then we project the large matrix A onto this, uh, onto this orthogonal subspace. We get a smaller matrix QJ, and also we project the right-hand side. And then we have a smaller Lyapunov equation to solve, Lyapunov equation to solve uh, for Y. And once, uh, well, we can solve the smaller Lyapunov equation using, say, Bartlett Stewart uh, or another algorithm uh, which works for uh, small, Lyap uh, for small um, Lyapunov equation. And then we uh, lift up the solution again to get the solution uh, X of the large Lyapunov equation. And then we expand QJ for a better approximation. So the question is now how to choose the QJ and what we'll do is use a rational Kurilov subspace. Um, so the, uh, the range of the Qs are, um, uh, are, are forming a, a sequence, sequence and they are all in, in, included in each other. And the way we choose the QJ is basically from this rational Kurilov subspace. The only difference to um, sort of an, an Arnoldi um, method or a, a Kurilov subspace, a general Kurilov subspace is that we uh, replace the matrix A that we would normally have here by a shifted uh, inverted version of, uh, of, of our matrix. So what you have to do, you, you choose shifts. And I'm not going to talk about how to choose these shifts. Um, there are so many methods uh, um, that tell you how to choose these shifts. It's not, not part of this discussion in, in this talk. Um, I'm assuming I've got some very good shifts uh, given. Uh, I shift the matrix um, and I invert it and multiply it successively with uh, the previous uh, matrix, essentially. So that builds a Krulov subspace, a rational Krulov subspace. And uh, we are using this uh, an orthogonal basis of this rational Krulov subspace to project it on. So what does the algorithm then look like? Well, a sort of plain vanilla version of the algorithm is uh, shown here. So we uh, normalize the right hand side uh, and we um, have to solve at every step a linear system. So that's red because that's the most important part here. So to build the Krulov subspace, we have to solve a linear system with a shift. Um, and A, remember, is very large. So we, we, um, we're putting a lot of work on, in, solving this, excuse me, in solving this linear system. Uh, the rest is just uh, expanding uh, the, the, the basis using the solution of this linear system using some sort of Gram-Schmidt algorithm. And uh, then we project, as I said before, both A and B onto, uh, uh, onto, this, um, uh, onto the subspace, and then we have to solve a smaller uh, system. So what I'd like to uh, point out is uh, we would actually like to solve a large Lyapunov equation, uh, or in general, a matrix equation, but I'm concentrating on Lyapunov equations here. Um, we're using this low rank uh, solver as the outer iteration, so that's my rational Krilov subspace method. But actually the most expensive part is this uh, solving this linear system. So we actually uh, want to save work by using an iterative uh, method, but then we have to put a lot of work on solving this linear system. And what I, um, uh, solving this linear system I call the inner iteration and the outer iteration is uh, the rational Krulov subspace method. For the inner iteration, I usually, uh, we usually use some um, preconditioned Krulov subspace method, GMRES, YCG, SAP, or um, MinRes if the system is symmetric. Uh, 
We could also use uh, direct solvers, but I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about that here. I'm, I've, got, I've got some comparison to MATLAB backslash uh, at the end of the talk. Of course, uh, maybe I should point this out. If, if the shift was was fixed, you you would actually uh, you would be better off using uh, say um, a factorization. Okay, so these are sort of inner outer type iterative methods or sometimes inexact uh, methods have been uh, you looked at before, and particular in the uh, in the framework of linear systems, so where the matrix vector product is applied uh, inexactly. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, in that area. So this is very incomplete. Uh, Valeri Simoncini and the Shield have done a lot of work in that area, and also from an S of Slayton and uh, many more. Uh, when it comes to eigenvalue problems, uh, what I mean with inexact solves there, it, it usually is when you um, usually comes down to solving shifted linear systems within an inner, inner iteration. So for example, for inverse iteration or uh, uh, shifted inverted Lanchos or shift invert uh, Arnoldi method and then you have to solve a linear system there and there's been some work uh, by, by many people which, which, you, which you all know uh, and the, the general uh, observation was always that uh, if you do new um, do inverse iteration or Newton type method so you can actually write inverse iteration as a Newton type method it turns out that you can start with a relatively coarse tolerance uh, and then during the iteration you reduce the tolerance, um, and when you do this, you actually save uh, some computational work because it initially you don't have to solve your system so exactly. Um, for Krilov methods, so, so Arnoldi type methods, Lanchos methods, etc., uh, it has been observed and also proved that you can actually start, you, you should start with a relatively small tolerance, but as you uh, proceed with the iteration, you, you can relax the tolerance, uh, and that's also leading to some uh, computational savings. Um, the second part is, uh, is basically the idea this is due to the Krulov subspace. You're already building some rich uh, information when you build the Krulov space. So um, you could think of, uh, you, you, you can explain this uh, behavior by basically saying you have already a lot of rich in information in the Krulov subspace and you can relax the tolerance. And actually, this is something we would probably expect from the rational pool of subspace as well. And uh, surprise, surprise, that, uh, that, will, that, that that's basically the, the message for my talk, that this will also happen for the, um, uh, for the rational pool of subspace applied, uh, the rational pool of subspace method applied to the Lyapunov equation. Okay, let me go into uh, sort of the maths. Um, you can write um, the rational Arnoldi decomposition that uh, arises from the pool of um, rational Krilov subspace method in, in, in this decomposition here. A is the matrix that we consider, Q is the matrix of orthogonal columns, and H and M are upper Hessenberg matrices. Um, and the matrix D that arises here actually contains all the shifts. Yeah, so this is the, the rational Arnoldi decomposition. We can also write this uh, in the following form where it probably reminds you more of the um, Arnoldi decomposition uh, where Tj here is not an upper Hessenberg matrix, so it's a, it's a, it's a dense matrix, um, but it's the projection of A onto the Krulov subspace and um, on, into the rational Krulov subspace uh, apologies. And you, you, get, uh, you get a term here, which is just a bit of a reminder of what you also get from the Arnoldi decomposition. Uh, the vector Gj is just uh, uh, given by, by this expression. So this is the exact uh, um, rational Krulov uh, rational Arnoldi decomposition. And the projection of A, uh, Tj, you can also write in, in the following form. So you can actually here see that Tj is not an uh, upper Hessenberg matrix. Right. Um, what, I'll, uh, what I also need is the Lyapunov residual. And there's been some work by Simoncini and Bruskin on how to actually express the Lyapunov residual, uh, which we'll need. So using this decomposition that I wrote here again, we can express the Lyapunov residual Rj. Uh, as well as the sum of fj and fj star and these two matrices are rank r matrices in general uh, for right hand side with rank one it's a rank one matrix um, qj is uh, um, the matrix that arises from the uh, rational pool of um, subspace decomposition so that's the matrix of orthogonal uh, columns and lj is this rank r matrix which you can probably see here that this is of rank r uh, you can see it's easily see it's of rank one if the right hand side is of rank one. 
and G is a vector and EJ is a, is a, uh, is a row vector. G is a column vector, EJ is a row vector. And then you can uh, compute the norm of the residual by basically just computing uh, the norm of uh, FJ, which is, uh, which is easily, uh, which can easily be computed because it is, it is the rank R matrix. Yeah. Not going into the details of that, but we will need this uh, rational, uh, we will need this residual for uh, when we actually look at uh, the uh, inexact version of uh, the uh, rational full of dot space matrix. So let's look at the inexact goal. Um, so what I'll do, instead of looking at the exact solution of this linear system, I look at the inexact solution to the right and uh, so we, we get a residual. Um, and uh, the residual uh, I call Sj, not to confuse it with the Lyapunov residual, which is R. And the residual is supposed to be smaller than some tolerance epsilon j. Usually what is chosen for epsilon j is basically the same tolerance as we want to solve the Lyapunov equation to, so tau, but we want to do better. Yeah, the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. Um, so let's write down the inexact uh, rational Arnoldi decomposition, which actually looks exactly like the rational uh, Arnoldi decomposition, but we now get this matrix Sj, which uh, uh, is, a, is a rectangular matrix which ha has all the linear systems residuals in it as, as columns, right? So if you didn't have this Sj term, I hope you can see my mouse, I made it very big. Um, then you would, have, would go back to the rational, the exact rational on all the decomposition. So this term here would, would disappear. So the inexact rational on all the decomposition looks just a little bit more complicated, but we can work with that and also compute the inexact uh, rational on all the residual, which is just um, a perturbation of the original residual by delta Fj and the delta Fj are written down here again and obviously includes the Fj. And if, if the arrows at every, um, if the linear system systems would be uh, solved exactly, this would be zero or nearly zero. And there's always a floating point error here as well. Um, so the computed residual is then uh, obviously um, uh, not equal to the residual that you uh, that you get from the uh, uh, inexact rational null no decomposition. So we can, um, yeah, this is, this is the observation. You have a computed residual, which is the norm of Fj, and then you've got the true residual, which is this perturbation, uh, perturbed residual. And using that, we can actually define the residual gap, which is basically the difference between these two residuals, uh, Rj and the computed residual, uh, so the true and the computed residual. And the computed, uh, the, the residual gap de depends on this delta Fj. So, the, the final, the, the important observation um, that, that we can, can then get is that both the computed residual and the residual gap need to be small in order um, to get an, a very good uh, solution, a solution which has an error of, of order epsilon. So both the residual gap needs to be small, this is the, the, the red uh, equation here, but also the computed residual needs to be small. And let's look at the residual gap. And for that, there I uh, would like to show you an important result. Um, namely, um, if you look at the projection, projected Lyapunov equation, at the J, and J is larger than K. So you do, you do J steps uh, of uh, this, uh, well, of the rational uh, uh, Kulov subspace method, and you have this projection, then um, you get that the entries of this uh, solution, yj of the small matrix, uh, the li entry can be bounded above by a constant um, and the residual at step k. So the residual at step k is the residual that you get uh, after k steps of the rational uh, full of subspace method and k is less than j. Yeah. So um, to explain this, I've actually uh, have this picture here. So what this means is that the off-diagonal entries of um, of the solution yj decay, yeah? and the decay depends on the uh, residual uh, at step k of the uh, of the rational uh, of sorry of the projected Lyapunov equation. And um, what is uh, in, in, important to note is that uh, this is actually a result that um, doesn't depend on the right hand side. So there are results on the decay of the solutions of the Lyapunov equations when you have a a low rank right inside, or uh, if, if you have a, a banded um, 
matrix uh, TJ, but here the matrix is, is, is full, right? There's no dependence on that. What, what is a little bit dangerous is this uh, minimum eigenvalue of A plus A transpose in the denominator, which appears in that bound here. Uh, but um, we actually, uh, well, if the field of values is close to the imaginary axis, which, uh, which is the danger here, because that might become close to zero, uh, then you're actually not very good with solving using a low rank solver anyway. So, uh, so you're kind of, kind of safe here, hopefully. Okay, so let's look at this residual gap here um, and try to bound this. So I've written down the residual gap. This is a re relatively easy equation, so I wrote it down here. I can bound this above by the norm of SJ times the sum HJ inverse YJ. And then I can actually split this uh, and write this in terms of a sum. And here I've got my residuals uh, at every step um, uh, of the linear solve of the, uh, of the linear system that arises. And here I've got another term which I can um, uh, bound again above by, well, the norm of PK star HJ inverse, and then also the norm of YJ, but the norm of YJ, I've just bound it. Uh, remember this pictures on, picture on the previous uh, slide. Um, I can bound by the Lapman of residual at step K minus one, yeah? So then I still have to bound this term here, which I'm not going to talk about here because there won't be much time. Uh, what you will see here, you've got, and a Hessenberg matrix at step to bound, um, you want to bound something at step K. And at that point, you don't actually have uh, the, J, the J Hessenberg matrix. So there's a quite a bit of work to actually get the bound here, but let's just assume for the purpose of this talk, it's a constant. Um, and so if we want to, um, if the Lyapunov residual decreases here, assuming this is a constant, we can increase the linear system residual. Yeah, so this is the, so if, if, if this residual decreases, we can increase that the residual. And that's the main point. And I'd like to show you uh, uh, what, what, we, what we chose in practice. So uh, for the linear system residual at step one, we chose a relatively small residual. Um, and for the, for the further steps, we basically increase the residual by one over the Lyapunov residual. Yeah, we increase the, the residual of the linear system. So. Okay, let me show you an example. I think I'm nearly uh, out of time, or I am out of time. Uh, so this is a relatively simple example, a 2D advection diffusion equation, um, n is a thousand, and we use uh, backslash for the, um, for the exact solve, and then we use inexact solve using, using pre-condition uh, GMRES. And what you see here, let me bring both of these uh, plots up. What you see here is um, the Lyapunov residual uh, for the exact solve on the inexact solve, and they are basically on top of each other. Um, and then you can see here how the uh, in how the linear system residual increases. So you get these sort of X plots because they look like an X. Um, a couple of more examples uh, where you can actually see uh, the savings, um, in particular for very large problem. And you can also see that this also works for generalized Lyapunov equations. Um, so we compare a solve with a fixed tolerance and a relaxed tolerance, and you, saw, you save quite a bit on the inner iterations, not so uh, much on computation time. And um, uh, the, the, the savings is about 50% in this case. Um, we also did the same thing for ADI methods, which I didn't talk about, but we get a similar amount of savings. Um, right, uh, let me conclude. Uh, so I've shown you some theory for inexact rational cooler subspace methods. Um, you've seen that there are quite a bit of savings when you when you do this. Um, we can extend this to ADI methods, uh, and also um, what I haven't pointed out, but uh, what you saw in in the in the um, in the table that uh, you, we can also beat the extended rational uh, extended cooler subspace methods. So that's uh, methods where you don't use shift. Um, and can use direct solve, uh, but this is only true for very large problems. So for smaller problems, the, the um, PK, uh, the extended pool of subspace method does a better job. And what I also haven't told you that this can be applied to Riccati equations. Um, right. So here's some references, and uh, thank you for listening, and uh, thank you very uh, and happy birthday, Nick. <laughs> <laughs>